I think our discussion in these five talks will be rather more than usually important. For we hope to bring in a quantity of material involving principles and points of doctrine that we have never before discussed. And as a beginning, I would like to lay certain foundations. In the first place, however, we must bear in mind that it is very easy in an obscure area to fall into opinion or to interpret somewhat more broadly than the facts justify, especially if we work from some basic conviction of our own. Therefore, I'm not going to dogmatize any of these points, merely to bring out where possible the historical facts and certain almost inevitable conclusions. Each person, however, should weigh these almost inevitable remarks with the same uh, criticism and judgment uh, that they would use in evaluating any body of evidence or circumstantial record. I want to deal first with two very interesting and unusual centuries. That 200-year period from approximately 100 B.C. to 100 A.D., the more we become interested in comparative religion, the more we realize that this particular period has interest and importance in widely scattered areas of human culture. Of course, in the midst of this period, the Western world received the impact of Christianity. But it must also be borne in mind uh, that the Christian faith for the first two or three centuries was a minority doctrine developing within a very restricted geographical and cultural area. We cannot therefore assume that Christianity of itself was responsible for all the other changes in distant regions, far from the possible contact with early Christian activity. Nor can we more readily assume that far and distant areas moved in upon the Mediterranean region uh, to completely change European culture. We must therefore move from a generality to be weighed and considered. We know that about 600 years before the beginning of the Christian era, a group of extraordinary religious and philosophical leaders arose within the space of a hundred years. Many of these men were contemporaries, and each left an indelible mark upon the culture of his own time and the area in which he lived. China received Confucius and Lao Tse, who were contemporaries, although Lao Tse was the elder man. During the very lifetime of these men, India received Buddha another of the great teachers of the world. We have the suspicion that there was a marked renaissance of Persian culture about this time, perhaps under the last of the Zoroasters, who it is said Pythagoras of Samos was personally acquainted with. In Greece it was Pythagoras who established the foundations of the great age of philosophy, which may well be termed the golden age of Greek learning. Here were, were a variety of impulses. 
bestowed almost simultaneously in different parts of the world. From this period, there moves a cycle of approximately 600 years, let us say between 500 and 600. In each case, within its own area, these foundations laid in the 6th century B.C. began to mature and evolve and develop systems of thought. We know what happened in Greece and how the Platonic philosophy rose definitely from the Pythagorean theory. We also realize that Pythagoreanism and Platonism became the dominant Mediterranean philosophies and attained this distinction between the 4th century B.C and the first century B.C. We also realize that in China the peculiar nature of Confucianism caused it to remain a very steady and comparatively unchanging structure. Confucianism was almost totally an ethical conviction and it could scarcely be changed or outlawed any more than we could actually change the golden rule. Its very structure did not permit it to become much involved in any religious or abstract formula. But Taoism, the teaching of Lao Tzu, at about the beginning of the Christian era, moved from a philosophical to a theological foundation and we find a tremendous expansion of Chinese metaphysics coinciding closely with, say, the first century uh, A.D. At about the same time, we find a tremendous internal change in the structure of Buddhism. We find as the result of the discovery of the mysterious secret books of Buddha in the Iron Tower by the Buddhist patriarch Nagarjuna. The Buddhism moved from a lofty philosophic agnosticism into a very involved, profound, and emotionally mature metaphysics with the advent of the Pure Land Doctrine or the Northern School, Mahayana Buddhism. As soon as Mahayana arose, the entire course of Buddhist history changed. And while there are still groups clinging strongly to the old way, most of the progress in Buddhism has been the result of the Mahayana groups operating in China, Korea, and Japan. They have represented the spearhead of the modernism of religion in Asia. About the same period, there were marked changes in Hinduism. Uh, the rise of mystical and transcendental schools for the interpretation of the ancient Vedic and Puranic writings. This change was also an enlargement into mysticism, a tremendous growth of metaphysical speculation and the development of systems of meditation and various types of mystical experience doctrines which were to play an important part in Asiatic culture. Even while Christianity was in its infancy, its direction was abruptly changed at almost the same time by the ministry of St. Paul. Uh, the Christianity of the four Gospels has gradually been absorbed into the Christology of the Epistles. And St. Paul stands forth as the person who transformed the moral code of Jesus into a highly transcendental universal doctrine of regeneration and redemption. Similar changes were occurring in Persian metaphysics. 
and we find the roots appearing also in Greek speculation. For about the beginning of the Christian era, the simple philosophic clarity of Plato's thinking became involved in the highly mystical speculations of the Neoplatonists and the Neopythagoreans, seated in that melting pot of commerce and culture, the ancient North African city of Alexandria. Also in this same time, cross groups began to emerge, mingling Greek thought with thinking of Christianity and producing such peculiar uh, groups as the Gnostics and the followers of Manes, the Manichaean group. In all of these instances, one simple point stands out. The gradual transformation of older doctrines into highly mystical revelations. Revelations that had one essential purpose behind them, and that was to change the concept of the transcendence of deity to the concept of the immanence of deity. This is a very important philosophical point. The mysterious God of old, or the godlings of ancient times, living in their remote Olympian or Samurian heights, uh, were a race of beings apart, inhabitants of heaven. But in this gradual change that took place, Deity was transformed into an eternal power everywhere present, always invisible, beyond definition, yet immediately available through certain transcendent achievements of human consciousness. We know that this change marked not only uh, the shift in the psychological integration of the Mediterranean region, but that it swept across the world. There are even vestiges of this change occurring in the Western Hemisphere among the primitive peoples, perhaps not so primitive peoples, of Central America. We find a gradual tendency to associate the rise of religious mysticism among the Mayas at a time approximating the beginning of the Christian era. This phenomenon was so remarkable that Lord Kingsborough, one of the greatest 19th century authorities on Central American culture, felt that it was almost certain that the mysterious deity Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, who came so strangely to Mexico, must have been one of the original apostles. In other words, there seemed no other way of explaining this, because there was no common communication between these peoples. Yet at almost one time, they all came to an almost identical conclusion, changed their entire religious course, and transformed the structure of religion from its archaic form to the type of religious understanding which we share and enjoy today. Now this obviously opens a very large area of speculation. There are many possible explanations, some rather impossible, which have still held a measure of favor. One broadly accepted uh, doctrine relating to this, or explanation for the circumstances, is the idea of coincidental emergence. We have parallels of this in simpler ways. We fre frequently hear, for example, of an invention that has been offered to the world. And it is not uncommon that the same invention shall appear in, the, in different places at the same time. 
several persons coming to almost identical conclusions and at almost the identical moment. Therefore, the coincidence concept is not quite as loose as might first appear, for it is based upon the assumption that time is measured by a series of events, and that whenever a culture or a group of persons or a civilization passes through certain experiences, there are corresponding innovations in that culture, changes in its doctrines and beliefs. Perhaps the interval of 600 years between the advent of the great teachers and the beginning of the Christian era brought several nations or several culture groups to almost the same psychological platform and there was no direction in which they could go except that direction which is most natural and common to human nature. Another explanation which requires perhaps a little more investigation is the concept that these changes were tied together, that actually there was greater commerce between these ancient cultures than we at this time assume to have existed. That it is quite possible that by the beginning of the Christian era a degree of world thought had been established, particularly along the caravan routes. And it is interesting that most of these innovations rose in regions along the caravan lines between Europe and Asia. Therefore, it is conceivable that Asiatics did visit uh, Western centers of learning. It is also quite possible that more Europeans visited Asia than we now realize. We know that Pythagoras was able in the 6th century BC to reach India. We know that the armies of Alexander the Great penetrated Asia. We do not know just how largely these motions contributed to world ideas. But one thing we can generally regard as undeniable, that the world of cultured, civilized nations came to about the same ideas at almost the same time. Of course, to the uh, devout transcendentalist or metaphysician, there is no problem at all. All these things are handled by invisible forces beyond human comprehension. Uh, we do not deny such a possibility, but we also like to see, if possible, some uh, more simple and explainable procedure. Uh, these transcendental solutions belong to the divine emergencies, and I would rather see first if we cannot find some common ground for assuming that these changes were made by at least partially natural means. And I think we can rather well establish this. Now you may wonder why all this has a bearing upon the Kabbalah and the doctrines of the early Jewish peoples. The importance lies in this very circumstance, namely that Kabbalism is perhaps the broadest term that we have for Jewish transcendentalism. Kabbalism is to the old Orthodox Jewish belief almost in the same relationship as Mahayana Buddhism to primitive Buddhism in India, or the theological Taoism to the primitive absolutism of Lao Tse. In each instance, we see the arising of a new point of view. And in the case of the Kabbalists, uh, this presents a semi-Western face for our examination, 
It is a rather compact package. It involves a limited group of persons, yet it is wonderfully symbolical of the entire world procedure. Not only are we concerned with these extraordinary coincidences and the timing, but we are also somewhat concerned with the internal symbolism of the various revelations that arose in a half a dozen areas of world culture at the same time. In the symbolism, we also seem to sense a relatedness. The symbolism would almost suggest that a number of people had read the same book or had become aware of the same basic facts or had attained to the same basic conviction and had then unfolded this illumination in terms familiar to their own people or in terms at least partly acceptable to the entrenched traditionalism of the areas in which they existed. Well, we must realize that all of these groups were opposed as they rose. They all passed through certain persecutions. They created resentments. They were declared to be heretical by someone. And perhaps it was this very persecution that gave to each of them the strong substance of survival. For we know things under persecution develop a tremendous strength and an integration that can never be found in more fortunate uh, environments. So we have now a world situation, and I, I think that the Dead Sea Scrolls situation uh, more or less fits into this. Uh, these scrolls are assumed to have been originally um, preserved or put away in the earth sometime in this interval between 100 B.C. and 100 A.D. We also have to remember that in these scrolls there are strong indications of a, of a heterodox attitude arising among Jewish mystical sects. I am no way convinced that these scrolls are Essene products. I do not think the Essenian community can be actually the source of them, although it may well have been the preserver of the old manuscripts. The Essenes themselves were a transition group between Orthodox Judaism and mysticism, and their entire history is noted only in these two mysterious centuries. After that, they disappear utterly from the pages of record and account. We do not know what happened to them but they form part of this strange bridge of doctrines that seem to connect an old world with a new concept of life. How shall we distinguish this new concept of life, for instance, in terms of our Kabbalism? The great book of the Kabbalah, certainly its outstanding text today, is the Sefer HaZohar, or the Book of the Splendors. This was first given to the world around the 12th or 13th century by Rabbi Moses de Leon. He insisted that he transcribed it from an ancient work. For nearly 300 years, perhaps 400 years, historians have thrown the lie to his teeth. They have said that Rabbi Moses wrote the work himself, that it had no roots in antiquity, and probably little, if any, roots in tradition. However, in the last century, our broadening knowledge of world culture has caused a general change of opinion 
and even so conservative a publication as the Encyclopedia Britannica, which can never be said to give much benefit uh, to abstractions. Uh, their article on the Kabbalah uh, states as the modern point of view that it is very probable that Rabbi Moses of Leon either was in possession of an earlier manuscript or was in possession of a valid oral tradition and that in all probabilities he was perfectly honest and perfectly sincere and entirely truthful in attributing the Zohar to a very much earlier date than the medieval scholars had admitted. According to Rabbi Moses, this work was actually uh, written about the beginning of the Christian era, just at this particularly critical time during the reign of the Roman Emperor Vespasian. Persecuted by the Romans and by the more traditionally bound members of the Sanhedrin, Rabbi Simeon ben Yochoi retired to a cave with his son. And in this cave he was visited by one of the angelic host. And through this angelic visitor and the intercession of the early prophets, he is said to have recorded the Book of the Splendors, the Sefa Azohar. We have at this time no reason to doubt that this book is a genuine midrash of Rabbi Simeon. That is, it was a work prepared by him, or at least committed to memory as the result of instruction which he gave. This particular work changed the entire complexion of Jewish thought. It belongs just as certainly to this transition period as the wonderful books found by Nagarjuna in the Iron Tower in India at almost exactly the same date. All this adds to the concept that prevails in the writings of Rabbi Simeon and in a parallel group of material prepared by Rabbi Akiba. A little later, Philo Judaeus, the most articulate philosophical spokesman of the Greco-Jewish school, uh, expanded this concept of Jewish mysticism far more uh, than had been previously possible and mingled its courses very closely with Neoplatonism. This was a very interesting time, a time of strange beliefs. Each people, in its own way, has explained the reason why that particular period should have produced these curious consequences. But there must have been some broader underlying generality which binds these together and makes them into one united idea. For example, among the teachings that arose among the Kabbalists and probably uh, may be traced back to Simeon ben Yokoi in the first century is the doctrine of Gilgulam. This particular doctrine is not commonly found in the West during the period of uh, the so-called rise of Kabbalism. The word simply means the doctrine of rebirth. Now, the Orthodox Jewish people uh, had certain beliefs about this, uh, but they were not at all clearly defined. It is held that the Pharisees did hold this doctrine in some estimation, and certain sects also regarded it highly. But with the rise of Kabbalism, it burst upon the philosophic mind of Europe. Now here's one of the points which I think we are mentioning perhaps for the first time, and that is the descent of the doctrine of rebirth in Europe 
from the fall of the Greek schools to the rise of modern knowledge. This doctrine was perpetuated in Europe. It was perpetuated not only by Jewish Kabbalists, but by Christian Kabbalists. And there was a thin thread of this belief, even in the Dark Ages, and in the period of the Renaissance, and down through the dawn of the modern way of thinking, with its indebtedness to Galileo, Harvey, Descartes, and other dawn thinkers of our modern generation. So this teaching suddenly flares up among the Jewish mystics. Why? How is it that a doctrine which had so little sympathy from their Christian neighbors and so little support from the Torah should have been developed in such exquisite detail in the Sefer HaZohar? This book was widely read and was widely influential among the literary-minded Jewish people. It attacked many principles of orthodox Jewry. It did not permit much of the psychological pattern that has always dominated Jewish personal and family life. It violated, in many respects, at least the prevalent interpretations of the Torah and the Mosaic Code. Yet it flourished in Spain, in Italy, in France, and was held by a large number of scholarly believers all the way down through the reigns of the Medicis and the Borgias. It's almost incredible to assume that a whole series of these doctrines moving westward, doctrines which were essentially so close to the Asiatic pattern of life could simply have come from nowhere or merely represented the speculations of single persons. Here we have another example of the development of traditions. These traditions bore very heavily upon the nature of the divine being at the root of life. And in the rise of the Zohar, we see the Jewish concept of deity undergoing marked changes, changes which were later to profoundly influence the Christian faith. How did these changes arise and where did they come from? Were they indigenous to Europe or the Near East? Or did they come from far Asia? As time goes on, I believe the general tendency will be to suspect far Asia. I think we will gradually be forced by the development of more adequate records uh, to recognize that religion is a common motion, and that it is like a river that may flow through one country but have its headwaters in another. And this um, diffusion of ideas was possible at the time with which we are most concerned. And it is very possible that the reason for this sudden outburst of similar doctrines in assorted regions came as the result of the maturing or developing of more adequate travel facilities, particularly uh, the increase of caravan trade. Uh, the trade was to provide luxuries for the Romans and the Latins, but the byproduct was the communication of ideas, for these traders brought with them their beliefs and their doctrines. We know that this trading process a few centuries later was to be the principal foundation for the rise of Islam. But for our present concern, I think the transformation of the nature of deity is the first matter to be considered.
Our primitive ancestors gradually passed from the worship of nature to the worship of spirits, from the recognition of visible forces to the acceptance of invisible causes behind or beyond these forces. These causes themselves pass through innumerable reformations on the part of man. As his experience increased, it became essential to revise his theology, to keep his theology abreast of his intellectual achievements and his physical experiences. Gradually, the concept of deity as represented in the Mosaic Code took form not in one area, but in many areas. And deity emerged as a being, a transcendent person. As the system was patriarchal, the deity assumed the aspect of the great father power. It was usually personified or impersonated as a most venerable person, a great superhuman being, a being, however, fashioned in the likeness of a man, a being like the mysterious and noble figure casting from his hands the sun and moon as represented on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. This being was the great patriarch and was compounded out of the elders, the heroes of long ago, the fathers of tribes, the venerated sages and scholars, the great priests and saints of long ago. All of these contributed their parts to the creation of the God image. And this God image was great of power, universal of authority, but subject like the creatures that fashioned it, to the whimsies of disposition and temperament, subject naturally uh, to favoritism in bringing particular advantage and security to its chosen people. This God image was remote, like perhaps the great golden figure of Zeus at Olympus. It was power but it was a power inscrutable, a power with which man could have very little intimate understanding association. It was a power that ran all things according to its own will. And in this power, men were but pawns in a great game. The gods could sweep away men merely by the will to do so. And these gods lived in a heaven world or region far from the abode of men, even though, like ancient Odin, they occasionally seated themselves upon the throne of all seeing and looked out upon the world to see that it was still in order. We find this kind of deity not only arising in the Near East, but having already arisen in other ancient regions as Egypt, India, and China. We find roots of it in the nature worship of Japan, Shinto. We see, therefore, God as the ancestor. We see God as the ancient one. And we also lived in a world ruled by certain inscrutable laws and processes, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This God was a God of justice and of vengeance. This was the deity whom men did not dare to offend. They could respect, they could fall in awe before the thought or image of this God, but they could not meet it with personal affection. It was too distant and too far, too high, too remote, uh, to have any immediate part in the workings of the world. 
This concept also had another frailty about it, which men, as they grew wiser, began to contemplate. There was a weakness in this God. For this deity, living alone in an inscrutable internal remoteness, was assumed to be the parent of creation. In the first place, man was unable to explain how or even why God should create. There seemed to be no particular reason for it, and the more men studied the creation, particularly other men, the more doubt they had in the divine wisdom in creating man in the first place. There were many legends that Deity so repented of this optimistic moment uh, that he swept away his creation time and time again. This uh, problem also caused the great question to arise, from what was creation fashioned? Did creation actually emerge as a result of a divine fiat? spoken in space by some vast shadowy being like that portrayed by Gustave Doré in some of his wonderful uh, paintings. Was creation from something or nothing? From what did the eternal creator fashion his world? Was the world created or had it always existed? Was deity merely one of a body of immortal beings that, like existence itself, had no beginning and no end? The problem of trying to rationalize the fashioning of a world by this strange and mysterious power confused and confounded the ablest thinkers of old time. They could uh, figure nothing more than a symbolical answer, like the tossing off of the sun in front and the moon behind. This, however, did not fully satisfy the rising realization of the principles of astronomy. There had to be some other explanation. This explanation uh, needed also a warmth in it. And if we look back on primitive religion, we see that there was an astonishing lack of real warmth. Men worshipped, but some way this worship was like the respect of a small child to an overstern parent. It was a respect to fear. This deity was wonderful and awful. It was a being which no one dared to offend. It was a father, however, in name only, for no one brought their troubles to this father. They brought offerings, they propitiated, they prayed, but they never felt a kinship with infinite life. This was long regarded as one of the basic weaknesses of Greek religion. Of all the religions of that period, probably the Greek was the most pleasant. It was the happiest. It was a worship of nature, and the rituals were well arranged, so there were festivities for every season. But even so, this did not represent a real sense of intimate experience. It was not until the rise of the Orphics that the human being in Greece had any real spiritual significance. He died and became a shadow. He had neither punishment nor reward in the world to come. He came forth as a flower and was cut down. And that was the story of him. It was only after philosophy began to ripen these concepts and the human heart began to sense an internal need 
that it turned away from the strange theological materialism of antiquity. This does not mean that the ancients had no God, but they had no personal God experience. They only worshipped before the temple. They never seemed to go in to find that which was hidden in the Aditam. They did not walk with God. Perhaps the old story that before the fall of man, God walked in the garden in the cool of the evening, carried some remembrance of other and better ways. But in the great rise of theology, God did not walk with men. He ruled them. He governed them. He punished them and rewarded them according to his own will and fancy. Now, it is quite possible that at a certain degree of cultural insight, many nations simultaneously outgrew this concept. We know that most of the countries where these changes took place were comparatively advanced in their sciences, their literature, their art, their poetry, their drama, and in their morality and ethics. Regardless of this particular point, however, we know they all did come to this immediate sensing of a great and wonderful need. To meet this need, a new type of thinking had to be devised. For there was a very deep problem here, one that the modern world probably will never fully comprehend or with which we may again be confronted one of these days when we make a sudden shift from materialism to idealism. If we produce a culture which remains materialistic for several centuries, and then this culture out of emergency within itself seeks to reestablish its own spiritual foundation, we may know something of what these peoples went through 2,000 years ago because it required a tremendous shift of perspective. One of the important uh, phases of this shift was the relationship between the individual and his own personal responsibilities. In the ancient world, the gods bestowed or withheld their ways were not only inscrutable, but, as far as man was concerned, unreasonable. There seemed to be no particular way of explaining why the unjust seemed to flourish and the just to suffer. There seemed to be no reasonable explanation for the disasters and tragedies of human existence. Therefore, it seemed reasonable to assume that a deity, perhaps with insight beyond our own, was the administrator of all this wonderful complexity. But about the beginning of the Christian era, there came into existence the tremendous sense of personal responsibility for destiny. It shines out at us through all of these different systems. Man's fate moves slowly into man's own keeping. This was not a sudden move, but it was a rapid one. And in this concept, it was necessary to revise previous attitudes. So we see a, a marked change in uh, a number of of beliefs. One of these marked changes included the rise of at least an archetypal form of the messianic dispensation. All of these peoples suddenly became aware of a power of intercession in space. This is particularly obvious in the Jewish instance. For among these people, 
the power of intercession had been comparatively slightly developed as a doctrine. But among the Kabbalists it arises in a very powerful way. We find also in India the strict teachings of Buddha are enlarged. Uh, Buddha passed through two processes after his death. By one of these processes he was deified, and by the other process he was, uh, we will say, absorbed into a structure of bodhisattvas, of celestial beings and attendants <coughs> who ministered to the spiritual needs of mankind. A savior concept emerged. Now at almost exactly the time <coughs> of the rise of the mystical dispensation in Christendom, the uh, Buddhist concept evolved their belief in a deity whom they called Amitabha, the Buddha of boundless light. This Amitabha power uh, was seated like a remote deity in the effulgency of space. But Amitabha was not a god in fact or substance. Amitabha was a human being deified by merit. After Amitabha had preserved his vow or kept his great vow which he made before attaining to the estate of an Arhat, he became uh, the ruler of the Golden Land, the land of peace, the New Jerusalem of Christianity, the city of four square, represented often in this actual way in China, Tibet, and Japan. Amitabha then caused to emerge from his own nature the Bodhisattva Avalokitesvara his beloved son. This Bodhisattva became his representative, his intercessor. And it is in the keeping of this Bodhisattva that Amitabha entrusted his world. And it was the duty and responsibility of Avalokitesvara to bring all souls to salvation through the grace of his own nature. Now this concept was in vogue in Asia, rising mysteriously and miraculously in the first century A.D. Avalokitesvara later becomes a male-female being, and in China and Japan is often disassociated entirely from its masculine attributes to become Kuan Yin or Kan Nan a purely feminine representation, now depicted carrying a small child in her arms. And uh, this particular circumstance so disconcerted the first Christian missionaries in the area that they were convinced that in some way these people were perverting the idea of the Virgin Mary. But here we have this concept arising on the opposite side of the world. We have a similar concept gradually unfolding into the later religion of the Egyptians where a comparatively unimportant local deity, Osiris, finally became the principal deity of Egypt and uh, then became the father of his own mysteriously, immaculately conceived son, Horus, who in turn becomes the savior of the world. The story of Horus is almost identically, the, in function, the story of Avalokitesvara. We find also in many other systems either personified beings representing salvation, as in the emergence of the Persian Mithras, but we also find the rise of doctrines of salvation revealed by beings who so loved mankind that they opened the royal roads of revelation. 
the whole picture fits together in a strange and interesting manner. Now in the beginning of Amidaism, as it is called in Japan, or the doctrine of Amitabha, we have the meaning. The Amitabha exists in two forms in Chinese-Tibetan philosophy. One is Amitabha, the, the Buddha of boundless light. The other is Amitayas, the Buddha of boundless life. These two are reflexes of each other, and in the Tibetan art are regarded as aspects of one being. And the word was light, and the light was the life of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. This is practically a Christian statement of Buddhist philosophy. Now how did the doctrine get across? Or let us go to the Kabbalah now. The Kabbalists no longer accepted the mysterious name of deity that is concealed under the acrostic of the Tetragrammaton, or the great name of four letters, which we have translated Jehovah. They declared that the mysterious power at the root of life, the Ancient of Days, that power which is eternal and immovable, is of a triadic nature, represented by three words, ain, boundlessness. That is that which is foreverness of its own eternal nature. That which goes on without beginning or end, representing an essence, a principle unchanging unto infinity that never this power was born, that this power shall never die. But very much like the effort made by Aristotle to establish the causelessness of first cause, simply represents the fact that causation is itself eternal, that causation is both a motion and a substance existing forever. This is almost identically the statement of Lao Tzu in, in describing the nature of Tao. And this was the same doctrine which at the beginning of the first century took over in China, at about the same period that we find it rising in North Africa, the Near East, and Southern Europe. Out of the nature of Ain comes Ain Sof. And Ain Sof is the boundless life. And out of the boundless life comes Ain Sof Air in the ancient Kabbalah. And that is the boundless light. So being life and light constitute the basic triad of the Kabbalah. Being life and light constitute the basic triad of Mahayana Buddhism. There is no essential difference. There is only such difference as would be inevitably the result of translation from one language to another. So Buddhism no longer remained a doctrine of the world of illusion and the total reality of a nirvana beyond. It now became a world filled with being life and light. And this triad became gradually further exemplified out of the nature of Amitayas, Amitabha, by the rise of this triad consisting of Amitayas, Avalokitesvara, and Daisechi. The, the being, this being consists of essence, of a super substantiality a changelessness. And this being exists in the innermost and the furthermost. It is diffused beyond dimension. It is called a zoic, in that it has no place nor placelessness. This being then suddenly 
steps out of the heavens as a person and steps into the atom. And that is where the Chinese put it, that is where the Hindu put it, and that is where Buddha himself said it was, because he actually referred to the atom by name in one of his discourses. Thus we have now a power as an absolute diffused ends or quality, a power from which nothing can be either more distant or more proximate, that actually, therefore, deity is the substance from which all substances arise. Deity is substance and substantiality. Deity is not only the creator, but in his own nature and substance the very material of creation. Therefore, God truly creates all things within his own likeness. And within this likeness, all things live and move and have their being. You can see quickly how this would shift the perspective from transcendence to eminence. For instead of deity being here or there, which was, of course, one of the great problems of Omar Khayyam. Deity is always everywhere. The Hindus gradually developed the concept in relation to Brahma, who ceased to be a three- or four-headed deity seated on a lotus and became the symbol of the all-pervading presence of universal substance. Now, when we refer to substance, in this case, we do not mean matter. By substance, we mean that which is substantial, or has a reality in itself. That which is not substantial is that to which a reality must be conferred. Therefore, that which is in itself, innately, the cause, the substance, the sustenance, and the power of itself, may be said to be substantial. This substantiality carried with it into infinite diffusion its own essential properties. Therefore, every inconceivable or conceivable unit of energy or of substance or of essence anywhere in existence was itself triadic consisting in its own nature of the essential completeness of the Godhead. This Godhead being the principle of being, the principle of life, and the principle of light. Uh, the ancients, and especially the Kabbalists, of course, would never leave even such words as life and light without going into the gematria and the notoricon of them. They had to go into the mystery for to them everything was a mystery. Every example of life was mysterious in this sense, as they themselves expressed it, that mystery is the vestment of eternity. Therefore, to discover reality, we must always penetrate mystery. If we penetrate mystery, we become wise. If mystery penetrates us, we become stupid. It is a very simple principle, but a very interesting one. Therefore, we are continually seeking to penetrate mystery. And in this mystery, we are seeking substance, essence, nature, being. To this triune nature, therefore, it became appropriate to bestow the term the Ancient of Days. It became a symbol of absolute antiquity as a solution to a problem. For to man, the problem of cause was more significant and more difficult than the problem of continuance. It would be simple to conceive of deity as ever-present under this system. But it would be more difficult to use this concept to explain first cause. Therefore, in their interpretation, 
the Kabbalists began to explore the meanings of life, light, and being in order to answer these essential root questions. We have already more or less summarized their idea of Ain, or being, the absolute profundity, the eternity of things. Not an eternity of time alone, but an eternity of condition and an eternity of limitlessness. So that this eternity had within it at all times the roots and rudiments of an emergence or a coming forth. Thus the Pythagoreans gradually developed the, the concept of, that, of being as seminal or full of seed, like the mysterious statue of Serapis in Alexandria, the body of which was covered with growing plants. Life to these people meant the emergence of active creative processes. Things become alive when they move, when they bear fruit when they continue, the first manifestation of life is involved with continuance. Therefore, absolute life is absolute continuance, which again relates to essence or total immortality. Uh, life, therefore, is manifested as a continuing unfoldment of the divine nature within itself from itself and by means of its own power. Light to these ancient peoples carried more than the illumination of the sun or the separation between day and night. Light to them was the light of internal comprehension. Therefore, into this mystery of creatures was introduced the element of comprehension so that these creatures could know, could be aware, could ultimately become conscious. And the end of light was that it should reveal the nature of the creating power. For the final purpose of light was that it should reveal truth. And truth in this system is nothing more than the total statement of the reality of being. Consequently, they had a very interesting and dynamic uh, interpretation of what had once been an almost unassailed uh, vastness of speculation. Uh, no man had dared to think of Zeus as other than an ancient bearded tyrant. But now came this new concept the concept of the God of the Kabbalah as appropriate, rep appropriately represented as paternal because of the absolute paternity of being. But this paternity now manifested through an absolute involvement in creation. In this way, it was possible to bridge the mysterious interval between God and man. It brought God and man together somewhere. And it also brought creation and creator uh, into the power of creating, which was their common uh, meeting place. This concept made way for mysticism as we know it. It made way for the possibility of the God experience in man. For if God dwelt in man as a, an essence uh, embodying or containing life and light, then this essential being could be under some condition knowable by man. Now the problem of knowability uh, in, recognized this uh, important special phase, namely that to know a thing, one must be that thing which is known. And man's power to know God 
resides in the beingness of God in man. Man is therefore truly an expression, interpretation, revelation, not of himself, but of deity. And all things are merely deity unfolding its own eternity. We find traces of Neoplatonism here. We find traces of Buddhism, of Hinduism. We find a whole variety of ancient beliefs moving in and forming a unit within this rising Kabbalistic concept of existence. The next point, naturally, was the effort to establish a practical working definition of deity. The Kabbalists evaded this, as nearly all other mystics have, on the ground of incomprehensibility. Actually, the only power which can be aware of itself is deity. All other powers have to be essentially aware of something that is not self. Therefore, man's inability to find his own source apart from God. The individual trying to be himself achieves nothing, because this self cannot be known apart from God, due to the fact that this true self is God. This was a Buddhist point also, that the individual seeking to posit his own nature at the root of life simply desecrates the divine nature. The individual who feels that he rises from his own causes has missed the essential principle of mysticism, namely that all things have but one cause in common, and that cause is the divine nature in themselves. We see this in Vedanta, we see it in Yoga, we see it rising in the disciplines of Tantra. All these schools gradually converge upon these essential principles. The next point that perhaps uh, might concern us is this bridging from the atom, which is God, the infinite atom of infinite greatness, the infinite atom of infinite smallness, both united, however, by both the state of infinite and by the state of structure. Both are strangely uh, atomic in their institution, in their uh, formation. To bridge this, how is it to be crossed? The Buddhists, the Taoists, the Kabbalists all come to the same conclusion, and St. Paul speaks loudly the same thought in connection with the experience of Christ, namely that there is only one way in which deity can be experienced, and that is through the individual gradually retiring into the innermost sanctuary of his own life, and there gradually ceasing to be himself. And in the complete cessation of himself lies the experience of divinity. Therefore, this experience is impossible to the egotist or the egocentric individual. This was one of the strong points of Buddhism and is one of the essential doctrines of the Kabbalah that the only way the individual can come finally along the 49 paths that lead to the mysterious ancient is a series of renunciations, a dropping away of humanity, and a corresponding enlargement of the experience of divinity. It is a reversal of the evolutionary procedure as we know it. It is a return uh, to a primordial and eternal condition. Now, both East and West have their explanations for the significance of this journey. Some may say that as long as man has emerged from the divine nature, uh, that man might as well continue to emerge and might go on and on and on to infinite individuality. Most systems have denied this, however, 
because this eternal continuance of self assails one of the absolute prerogatives of deity, namely that deity and deity alone is immortal. Therefore, any human being striving for immortality can attain this end legitimately only by re-identification with deity itself. A separate immortality was inconceivable both to the Kabbalists and the Buddhists. And to a measure it was also inconceivable to the Christian of this period. It has still remained a very great question in theology. But most mystics have always assumed that the ultimate state of man has to be re-identification with deity inasmuch as there is no other conceivable end, as all bodies must go down to the common earth, so all spirits must return to the common father. There is no other end. This common father, this eternal unconditioned essence, as represented in both East and Western metaphysics, should have led and could have led to one of the most practical of all results, namely the recognition of the identity of all religious belief. But for some reason it didn't quite get there. The reason it didn't get there, according to both systems, rests in the concept of egoism. The concept that the individual has an enduring existence of himself and is able to confer this separate survival upon his own institutions, which he has never yet quite been able to demonstrate. It is to the uh, individualist, therefore, that the concept of a desirable individual destiny holds the greatest attraction. But to those who have studied the most abstract forms of religious idealism, are in common accord that the noblest religious concept that we have today must be, as Paul says, uh, quoting from the Roman poet concerning the nature of God, we are his children. That it is like the parable son of the prodigal son returning to his father's house, that in the end all things return to the earth or to God. Therefore, in a sense, deity becomes a symbol of earth, an earth of deity. For as earth swallows up the dead, so deity absorbs the living. There cannot be anything left suspended between these opposites and going nowhere. In the Jewish mysticism, the development of the great concept, resulted also in a secondary God form. This secondary God form was called Macroprosophus, or the long face. The Macroprosophus represented the revelation of deity in the creation process. And there emerged out of the mystery of infinite being the gigantic figure like the giant of the vision of Nebuchadnezzar, a mysterious and colossal figure with one foot upon the oceans and the other upon the land, around whose body the stars and planets moved and whose face was always in profile because deity was re represented always with one eye. This mysterious macroprosophus, or the long face, was the clothed God. No longer clothed as an old gentleman, uh, even with the most ecclesiastical habiliments, <coughs> but clothed in creation. God as creation. God as cosmos as an infinite diversity of universes and solar systems, as made up of a great cluster of stars holding in its hand the jewel of the universal cosmic galaxy. 
The vestments of this being were like the radiant fringe of the Milky Way, and it was surrounded by angels full of eyes, which were the stars, and its vehicle was the Merkava of Ezekiel, the chariot of righteousness. And in the midst of this great machinery of the universe sat the Ancient of the Most Ancients, the power at the root of all things, unchangeable and in its own visage unknowable. We now have Ain, Ain Sof, and Ain Sof Air revealed through the great face with its threefold forked beard. The hairs of the beard being the streamers of energy moving from the three powers of the deity. These are the mysterious lines of energy that are also seen moving from the heads and hands and hearts of Eastern deities. This macroprosophus, or the long face, rises above the horizon of infinites, like a sun rising from darkness. And because this horizon of infinites resembles more than anything else a great ocean, it is represented as a mirror. And as the face rises above, the reflection of the face inverted appears in the ocean beneath. And therefore we have the two great faces, one looking down, one looking up from the shadows below. These two faces therefore represent the aspects of creation. Creation being a divine power moving and a great natural area moved. And the spirits of Elohim moved upon the face of the waters. And the firmaments were divided. And the heaven which was above the earth was divided from the heaven which was beneath the earth. And the universe was therefore divided between the aspects of the two great faces, the one the reality and the other the illusion. For the inverted face was illusion, and the inverted face had no substance because it was reflected from the great rising visage coming over the horizon of eternity. Here are your two essential worlds of Buddhism, the world of being and the world of not being, the world of truth and the world of error the world of divine mind and the world of mortal mind. We have the truth and the dream, with the dream merely being truth inverted. And the inverted truth becomes evil. And the inverted truth becomes the spirit of negation. And daemon as deus inversus, God or the, uh, rather the devil is God upside down. This was one of the oldest of the rabbinical beliefs of the Kabbalists, that in the material world of things, everything is apparently reversed. That which is truly the highest shall appear to be the lowest, and that which appears to be the lowest shall be the highest. And that which was apparently in the beginning shall be the end. And that which was in the end, or is in the end, shall have been that which was in the beginning. Every one of these patterns strangely inverted. Inversion to the Kabbalist impelled the concept of the perversion of power. Therefore, to these people, mortal knowledge was truth upside down. To them, the wisdom of the wise was as the ignorance of God. All mortal knowledge has to be truth seen wrongly. And all divine knowledge is truth seen rightly. Thus, uh, we have in both of these systems uh, the concept of false value, as recognized again in the words of Christ, where he tells that those who save their lives shall lose them, and those who lose their lives in the service of truth shall gain immortal life. Everything is the reverse of the appearances 
of things. So Macrosophus, the great face, has, a great, has real meaning and tremendous interest to modern science. And I am told, I do not know that this is true, but it's been reported to me that Einstein was a student of the Kabbalah, and that he was profoundly impressed by the abstractions of this ancient knowledge, sensing in it, perhaps, the keys to grand values as yet comparatively unrecognized in the fields of specialized learning. The macroprosophus, or the great face there, or represents to a measure the space we are seeking to conquer. It represents all of the greats outside spaces. For if we put all eternity together, it forms the features of a divine face gazing down upon us, or gazing at us from the infinite and the remote. Now the ancient Kabbalists devised another term, microprosophus or the small face. Now the little face has its relationship to man in the same measure that the great face has to the universe. The little face rises in the sunrise of the soul in the human heart. As it rises it casts also its reflection upon the illusionary parts of man's nature. So that man, uh, watching the sunrise of truth within his own nature, at the same time experiences the birth of error, again the inversion of the fact. And in this inversion comes also the perversion of purposes and principles. Buddha said, of course, that the primary perversion was the attempt to achieve externally in this world a degree of security that can only be attained internally. That man, therefore, seeking to perfect his outer world, was a slave of illusion, for that the primary purpose was the perfection of the inner world. Was it the intention of deity that man should perfect his outer life then his outer life would by its own nature be stable, which is not the case. And the individual, having given sixty or seventy or eighty years to the advancement of his physical estate, finds that nature steps in and takes him away. Therefore it becomes uncertain that the perfection of this state is his primary project, that this represents to a measure the inverted face the face of things not in themselves true, but having a likeness of truth. This likeness being the most dangerous of errors, uh, a falseness masquerading under a reasonable or attractive guise. Thus as the sunrise of Macroprosophus, or the great face, brought forth the mystery of the worlds, so the rising sun of Microprosopus brings forth the child from the womb, establishes the soul in man, and causes it to be appropriate, therefore, for the universe of the human body, or the composite man, to be called a microcosm, and the universe of the great face to be called a macrocosm, terms very common in medieval thinking, but less frequently found among modern scholars. The next situation that suggests a little thinking would therefore have to do uh, with this entrance of a mystical factor, which is to bridge the interval between God and man. In uh, Christianity, this interval is indicated or suggested by St. Paul under the idea of the practice of charitas, or love. Love, beauty, unselfishness, all of the most noble of human emotions were recognized as bridges by means of which man could approach the reality in his own nature. This reality was not primarily intellectual, either in the Kabbalah or in any of the other systems. This, this reality had to be experienced 
and an experience is, of, is that of the senses or of the emotions rather than of the intellect. The mind can attain to certain distinctions, but it cannot achieve the direct experience which is reserved for uh, what the ancients regarded as sacred love, or that love which is permitted by religion, that love which is without corruption, selfishness, or decadence within its own nature. So in this mystery of compassion or love, uh, the ancients everywhere established their mediator between heaven and earth, between God and man. And in the uh, Kabbalistic system, this principle is also present. And in one of the later discussions, we will go into it, but all we want to express now is the fact that in the Kabbalah, an instrument or a vehicle was set up whereby the soul of the righteous might find God. This vehicle, or the chariot of righteousness, uh, had its grounding or its foundation in very deep metaphysical principles. In the Buddhistic system, this embodiment of love, of course, is found in the figure of Kuan, uh, Kuan Yin or Kanman, Avalokitas Vara, the deity of compassion, signifying the regeneration of all passions and the fulfillment of the vow of selflessness. Other faiths also have this embodiment. Sometimes this principle is embodied as a person, sometimes it is presented as a, as a vehicle or a kind of means of travel, like the Chinese ship of the doctrine, but in every instance it is made possible because of a great unselfishness, that there is some one being so perfected above other beings that it may intercede for the common good of human natures. This is, of course, also conveyed in the Maitreya concept and in the Horus concept in Egypt. It is certainly the very soul of St. Paul's interpretation of the Christ ministry, and it is found in a slightly altered form but equally valuable in the Kabbalistic story. Thus deity becomes in the Kabbalah uh, the most comprehensive aspect of God that perhaps we can conceive of. The interpretation goes on and on and on into infinite diversity, but it uh, is a total concept, a concept in which there is no need for beginning or end, no need for the explanation of how things started or how they will be completed. All things being in themselves infinite unite in the nature of the sovereign infinite. And this sovereign intimate, uh, infinite consists of the 49 paths of the Sefer Yitzira, which it is said Moses, the beloved of God, walked the 49 paths, which were the mysterious numbers of the seven times seven. And at the end of the 49 paths, Moses went to sleep on the mountain of Moab, and the angel of the Lord took him into the heavenly region. The Kabbalah said that there are 50 paths. Moses achieved 49 of these paths, but was not privileged to enter the promised land, the promised land being the equivalent of the Buddhist nirvana. In order that the 50th path may, may be uh, achieved, there must come another who shall follow after Moses, but shall be preferred before him. And this other one, the Messiah, will be permitted to pass the 50th gate, and in so doing will open the way of salvation to all men. This is one of the elements of the Kabbalah. Now you can see how this does break through and make ground for the messianic idea or the mysterious one who is to come. 
Now, in Orthodox Jewry, the waiting for the Messiah continues. In the Kabbalah, I believe that the concept of this Messiah principle is innate in the entire nature of deity. In other words, the Messiah is not a separate being from God. The Messiah is the love of God uh, added to the previous attributes. So the deity becomes being, life, light, and love. And this mysterious power of love is the mysterious hidden forehead of Brahma, the power that is not to be seen in the beginning of things, but ripens out of the fullness of the mystery. For this love, again, is like the Merkava of righteousness, it is the power of the soul. And this power of the soul, though latent in deity, is that part of the divine mystery which must be completed by the creature and not by the creator. Therefore, in the process of enfolding life, in the process of growth, man experiences the rise of a new relationship with life. And as he matures, love is born as a soul in him. And it is this soul power in him which will ultimately be his savior. And it is present in deity or it could not be born in man. But its birth in man is a voluntary act. And the cultivation of this power is where determinism comes into what would otherwise appear to be a locked cycle of God's will. This determinism being the fact that man has the power or will develop the power to fashion from his own nature the very bridge upon which he must cross uh, in order to reach the other shore of truth. The power of this bridge is the seed in him. It has always been present. But whereas nature will perfect his body and reason will perfect his mind, only man's own internal dedication will perfect the bridge by means of which he crosses from one state to another. This is the ship of the doctrine that is formed from the body of the holy Bodhisattva. This is also the nave of the church, for the ancients regarded the ecclesia or the church as the ship of this salvation. And they therefore regarded it as the symbol of concord, a design set up by God to carry all souls to their ultimate reunion with deity. In this, then, the soul of man becomes something that is called the immortal mortal. It becomes like the hero gods of the ancient times. For this, is, this soul is something that has a birth in time, but a continuance in eternity. This is the only thing which is born but does not die. There is a belief, of course, that in a mysterious way it does die. But the soul power of it does endure and does continue. The uh, identification by the Christian Kabbalists of the soul principle with the crucifixion of Christ is, I think, also worth noting. Because in this case, Christ representing the power of the soul does die for the sin of the world, but is restored or resurrected in due time. This concept of soul, therefore, forming a bridge, permits another aspect to arise, namely the shadow bridge, or the bridge of the inverted face. For the soul, if perverted, becomes the angel of self-destruction, and the, the perverted soul becomes the bridge to Gehenna the symbol of the bridge to limbo or destruction. Thus upon our affections or our loves, according to the uh, ancient peoples, 
uh, we build the power to conceive the nature of God. And that which does not love cannot know God. And that which do does not love its fellow man which it hath seen, how can it love its Father in heaven whom it hath not seen? So to the ancients, regenerated affection, represented by the vow of Amitabha, the unselfish dedication of the human being to the service of others because of a great love for God and man, this becomes the bridge of salvation. The Kabbalah is very explicit on this point. It tells us very definitely of this machinery, and that therefore man is building the bridge of immortality by the unfoldment of his own natural dedications, that he cannot think himself to the other shore. He can only experience himself there by self-forgetfulness, by the dedication of life to the service of life, he moves triumphantly upon this mystery. For it is said in China that when the great sage Daruma, a Bodhidharma, a patriarch of Zen, resolved to visit China, he stepped out upon the leaf of a plant, and in meditation upon the needs of China, he was carried upon this leaf across the sea, so that he was described as the sea-walking Brahmin. And when he came out of his meditation, he found himself in China, having crossed the waters without a ship. And this was because in his meditation he had asked that his life could be devoted to the unselfish purpose of making possible the improvement of the spiritual understanding of the Chinese and the instruction of these people in the mysteries of the true doctrine. As a reward for that, he was carried untroubled across the ocean. This is the same concept. In the idea of love, man crossed the ocean interval that divides this shore from the other shore, the mysterious river we all must cross in the old Christian hymn. So in the Kabbalah, this growing, unfolding soul power of man becomes the mysterious Merkava of righteousness. It is therefore the dedicated conduct of the person that forms within itself the immortal mortal. And it is this immortal mortal that guides the traveler through the mysterious underworld of the mysteries of Greece and Rome to the final presence of the Hierophant the Lord of the Mysteries. It is the same concept again as the figure standing in the midst of the candlesticks of Revelation. And the entire symbolism of Revelation has to do with this mysterious journey from worldliness to godliness across the mysterious ocean of doubts. It is another wandering in the mystery lands of Dante's Inferno. The journey from ignorance to truth, carried or led by Virgil, and in this case Virgil representing the human soul, for Virgil was the poet, not the philosopher. He was the mystic, not the intellectual. And the muse of great poetry, the mysterious winged horse Pegasus, was the one that carried the souls of the illustrious into the wonderful worlds beyond in the old legendary and lore. And the point, the way of the point, was represented as the way of the heart doctrine. So the heart doctrine is found in all of these philosophies and principles. And it is by means of the heart doctrine that the child returns to the parent and man comes again into the mysterious experience of the presence of the Great One whose face is veiled with 10,000 veils, <coughs> as it was seen by Moses upon the blazing crest of the mountain. All of these principles were involved in Kabbalistic speculation, and I think they have considerable meaning to us right now, and we hope you'll think so too as we go on with this next week. Thank you very much.